for all those tuning in, thank you so much for uh, tuning in and watching. My name is Jay Shock. I'm an independent curator and art historian, as well as the exhibition coordinator of the Claire Davidson Siegel Gallery, uh, located on the lower level of the Patch of Medford Library. I'm joined today by the artists of the current exhibition, Places We've Been, with uh, Tina Folks and Brian Gutman. Tina and Brian, thank you so much for uh, taking some time out of your day to discuss the exhibition. Thank you thank for you. Uh, for having us, Jay. We look forward to, to the conversation today. Yeah. <laughs> so I was wondering if we can just do some brief introductions, uh, maybe talk a little bit about yourself, where you come from, and maybe like your where where you trained to become an artist. Yes, um, I um, started painting when I was five years old. It just uh, came naturally to me, and you know started with you know paper and pencil and watercolors. And then um, I studied art all through uh, K through 12. And um, I primarily uh, work in uh, oil paintings or acrylic paintings. And, um, you know, been doing that ever since. And so where'd you go to school again, bro? Oh, yes, I uh, got my uh, BFA, bachelor's degree at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, um, 1977, and then uh, my MFA at Brooklyn College in Brooklyn, New York in 1984. Mm -hmm. And I actually became interested in decorative painting through a paper I had written for a class. And then uh, I went to Parsons School of Design to study uh, faux finishing classes there. And did you do that after your MFA? You yes. Parsons? Okay. Several years after it, I uh, I was introduced to the faux finishing by a friend of mine, and you know I, I just learned as I went, and uh, it was primarily oil paints. And then at the time, Parsons was offering courses on uh, acrylic based products, mm -hmm. and so I wanted to uh, discover that. So uh, and they were very informal classes, two three days a week. And so it was able to fit it into a work schedule pretty easy. And uh, yeah, it was very helpful. What is faux finishing? It is um, actually uh, like fooling the eye. Uh, I studied a, a lot of wood graining, uh, all different kinds of uh, woods. And uh, the way I would apply it is if say a, a client had uh, a mahogany installed on their walls and then they had white new windows put in and they'd want the windows to match the wood graining and okay. um, a lot of uh, switch plates or heat sensors they want uh, all that blended in and so uh, that's primarily the the big application of my work but I can also do marbles or precious metals yeah, stone finishes uh, you know things like that wow that's pretty impressive yeah, it's fun. Yeah. And Tina, where you went to school too, right? Where did you study? Yes, I did, Jay. Um, so I went to Marymount College in Tarrytown, New York, uh, graduated in 84 as a studio art major, got my BA there. And then uh, I had an apprenticeship to a potter in New Haven for a year, uh, which was great because I really learned a lot of hands-on studio uh, knowledge and the way things work and how to make a living, possibly being a potter. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that inspired me to continue my studies at Parsons School of Design in New York City. There were two ceramists who I really admired who were teaching there at the time, Dorothy Havner um, and uh, Merrick Setsula. Uh, they were both um, uh, very well-known ceramic designers and so uh, I studied there and uh, after that I went on I, I was involved in a special program through Parsons to study with a small group of us from Parsons uh, to go to uh, Germany oh, wow. to produce a coffee set that we designed each individually uh, in the um, factory of Villeroy and Bach and that was for a summer and it was great we got a royalty on that and we signed it and Parsons had their label on it as well it was 
very exciting. That's pretty cool. That that really was a rite of, rite of passage into yeah. kind of uh, setting up my own studio or feeling like I could because I really understood the process and um, had to, had to work it. And so uh, so let's see. About a year or so after that, I moved back out here to Long Island and I did set up a studio of my own and. Uh, created a line and uh, marketed it and did wholesale shows and did that for several years and then moved into different other applications, mosaics and tile and um, eventually my totems, which that was the final stage of my, my ceramic work. Yeah. And, uh, and then from there, uh, I moved into sketching and illustration. I needed a change and uh, I evolved in, into that and I've been doing that for the last five years. So yeah, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, now you both went to Parsons and uh, of course we should talk that you two are married too. Is that how you guys met during Parsons or how did you two? No, uh, you guys no, no. We, we met actually when I moved back out here, uh, after yeah, when I moved back out here to set up my own studio mm -hmm. is when Brian and I met and we met through mutual friends. Okay. And uh, the next day we visited each, each other's studios and we've been inseparable ever since. <laughs> so that was uh, 30 <laughs> years ago. So here we're, we are. It worked out yeah. pretty well. Yeah, I think yeah. so. <laughs> it, was, it was great. It was and where were your studios based originally? Uh, so mine was in West Hampton. Uh, I had a basement space uh, in a vacant building, and Brian, you were in a warehouse. I was in a warehouse yeah. in, uh, in Quag, north of the railroad tracks, wow. and uh, it, there was like an auto mechanic next door, and my brother's a woodworker, so he had the shop, and so we shared it, and uh, it was, you know, great industrial space. I had paintings, you know, up two uh, stories high on yeah the wall. i remember and, you know, I could open the, in warm weather open the front door and let the light in and uh yeah it was a really nice space so i was there for several years i remember feeling very impressed when i came over to see your space brian <laughs> i thought wow here's a real artist <laughs> that, that does sound like a pretty impressive space though yeah yeah it, yeah, was... it was neat you know it was you know rough enough too you know it was you know, an auto body guy next door who I became friendly with. And, you know, the train tracks were, you know, 100 yards away. So yeah. I just love all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Really. yeah it was like a, a drawing Robert Crumb would do or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great. Very it was, industrial. Yeah. It was neat to go over there. Yeah. You know, um, so I know you're both full time artists too. Do you guys do anything in addition to your art practices? I know you have a business together too, right? Yes, 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 we do. It's called Fee Fi Fo Inc. <laughs> and uh, we've had the business for well, it's, it's been we've been incorporated since 02. Um, and uh, but we hang wallpaper uh, and fabrics and specialty goods as well as the faux finishing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's you know, we're very busy with that. That's uh, so we're, we like to call ourselves artisans who work in the trades. Yeah. So um, we're always on job sites. We work with designers and directly with homeowners um, uh, out east. You know, in the in the residential market, uh, second home market, really. Yeah. Um, so, but that's that's a lot of fun because we get to see beautiful homes and work with beautiful materials and um yeah places we never get into otherwise yeah, yeah. Really. yeah so and do you have multiple projects going on at the same time or always it, always always, always. Yeah. always yeah always. and a lot of times we'll work together yeah. but you know if we get in a jam where three people want us there the same day we're like yeah. okay you go here i'll go there and then we'll go there after work and yeah you, know, you just <laughs> you just, you just it juggle out. it it's just a way, way it's always been so <laughs> and then the opposite can happen where all of a sudden all right we've got no work for three days and then we'll go do artwork yeah okay so yeah, yeah i was gonna say because it sounds like especially now i know you, we talked before the the recording that 
there seems like there's no off season now, like the, the busy season is extending and going long. Yes. And you're, yes. you're working on all these different projects concurrently, but you're also, uh, Brian, I also know you're, you're a musician too, and you, you play mm-hmm. music. Yes. So you have a lot going on. And how do you, how do you guys find time to dedicate like studio time to like work on your paintings or work on your mixed media works? It's pretty much, you know, we have to follow the flow of the business and, you know, we'll see, okay, we're going to have an ebb over here. So let's just plan on that, you know, doing it then. Yeah. Well, though, but Jay, sometimes what I've gotten into the habit recently of using is, is my Google calendar mm-hmm. and it's a great visual tool and I've only been using it for a few months. But what I find is that when I can block in time for creative time because it's all color coded right with different right. subjects then in my mind i know it's there i can see it it's it's it's, it's almost like in a container so it's, yeah. it's it's a time block that's dedicated to that so regardless of whether i feel particularly inspired or not it's it makes it easier for me to just know in my mind well that's my time that's my two hour block and i'll go upstairs and maybe i don't know what i'm gonna do mm-hmm. a lot of times i don't but if I start to move things around a little bit, move my chair, go through a sketchbook I have laying out, or uh, sometimes I'll just go through my Instagram feed and see what's going on. Uh, just getting started on something, one thing leads to another, and that's sometimes how I get started. There are other times when I do have a project that I, I leave laid out just so I can sit right down and dive in and makes it easier. But um. You know, I think I think just blocking in the time and mentally knowing that you have it set aside gives it some importance also. And uh, that's that's kind of what's how it works for me anyway. Um, now, is it because you said it's a two hour block, too? Do you keep to like a two hour block every day from like this hour to this hour? Or is it a more does it have to be more fluid due to due to your schedule? Like, well, I think it's a combination. Like I usually leave my my evening time uh for creative time okay that's always on my calendar um sometimes i'm just too exhausted from work literally physically that i just can't but i'll read so i'll read at night instead um but uh but for instance if if we know weekend is free that's like art time we'll dedicate either the saturday or the sunday to an art day and there's no interruptions you know we we come down meet at three o'clock for tea we'll have lunch before that we go back to our prospective projects and so we definitely take a weekend day when we can and just dedicate a full day to that you know we have to it's just it's just part of our it's what we need to do it's the way it works and the way it happens yeah yeah now do you I'm sorry. I was I, gonna I say, find do with you... painting, I have to, I can't be tired to paint, you know. So in the evenings, a lot of times I'll I'll just download music, and uh, things like that that I need. Uh, but you know, I need to get up fresh in the morning to you know get out the paints and work on a big painting. Mm-hmm. And I think it's encouraging to hear like artists saying like, because as, again, I, of course, I'm not an artist too, but sometimes after like a long day of work, like it takes you a while to transition into like the next stage. Like I do these lectures and these uh-huh. art exhibits too. And sometimes I'm like, after, after the end of the day, uh, even for preparation for this uh, talk, I'm like, oh, I got to write the interview questions or I got to write, I still got to write the exhibition essay. And uh, right. it's a matter of like, sometimes you're like, oh, I just worked all day. I don't want to do it. But mm-hmm. I think it's encouraging to hear, like you don't necessarily need to be at your workstation or at, in front of a, a canvas or a panel and actually be physically painting. Like the creative process can be more getting into right. that mental state and then taking like that time yeah. just for yourself and to kind of recharge before you you let the mind kind of recharge and then naturally the creative yes. juices start to flow am i understanding that right right oh, exactly yes. jay you know and and um it also helps too to just sort of carry around a little notebook you probably do that you know yeah. you write down yeah, right, if you're yeah. especially if you're working on different things <laughs> you know maybe like for for instance this you know thoughts occur to you when you're washing the dishes or when you're you're driving the car or wherever, you know, 
totally unrelated, you know, things just come in and you want to be able to capture that and yeah. remember, you know, certain things. And so that also helps to have a little book and go, oh yeah, that's right. You know, these are things I can start on. So you're not like starting from ground zero and going, okay, what am I going to make? What am I going to start on? It's like, oh no, no, wait, remember those notes I took today? Dive into that. Yeah. So tools like that, you know, and like you said, Jay, you know, it's, that's all part of the process. You know, it's not, it doesn't only count when you are making things, you know, there's things you do before, during and after to create yeah. that thing, you know, that so, so um, yeah, it's all part of it. It's all <laughs> tired. Sometimes you come up with mistakes happen and they become seeds for something the next morning you go oh my god I did that oh that's great now I'll go in this direction you know because sometimes you know when you when you're not thinking and you can't think those sometimes are the the times that you come up with very freeing ideas yeah. you know so yeah, and for me the greatest like tool is the uh having the cell phone camera because mm -hmm. uh I mean I'll see things during the day and photograph it or, uh, mm -hmm. for instance, last week we had to go out on the North Fork to do an estimate. And I said, wait, there's one spot that I want to stop and photograph after we're done with the estimate. When and the lighting was just right. Yeah. Oh, it was yeah. in the morning. It was in the after early afternoon. In fact, it's one of the paintings yeah. in the show, that yeah. uh, spot with the, uh, yeah. the creek uh, that goes uh, way back in the distance. It's a small one. In New like, Suffolk. In oh, New yeah. Suffolk. Here we go. Which one is that? um keep going oh i think i know this is it this that one, one there that one. yeah this also, I, yeah. yeah i said we're going to be passing that so uh it was a beautiful day like today mm -hmm. and uh you know we made a point of stopping there and you know took a dozen photos so uh have reference for another painting yeah that, that's the thing too you know is having the cell phone you can capture things that you think are seeds for for inspiration it's just it's such an, an immediate tool and we all have have one and so yeah. it's it easy to and and you can make mental notes or yeah. write them down a little book too and so all these things help you get started when you have a window of time you know yeah um so brian you work primarily off of photographs right yes i when do these landscapes uh, uh early on um i I bought a French easel and would go out on location and uh, and that was fun because you know it was different from being in the studio obviously the natural light you know the change throughout the day the weather everything and like you're experiencing that. the elements and experiencing yeah. that you know that comes through but uh, a lot of times that's not possible or I mean, it's a lot of effort to do that to go out and get set up and bring lunch and bug repellent and everything. So uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, as I say, I do a lot of these reference photos and uh, I'll, I'll work from those. Yeah. Well, now sometimes, I, Brian, you will start something outside. I've seen you do that. And right. then you finish it in the studio. Finish a lot of times studios. you'll do that and use the photos as reference for that. Yes. Yeah. And after a while, you're not using the photos. You're looking at the piece and you know, let's, you know, let it finish itself. What does it need over here? Right, it has a life of its own. Uh, yeah. Okay. Its own. Yeah. So you're using like nature and you're using photographs as like the basis and then you kind of let the work of art dictate where it's going to go. Like Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. I've seen you work like that often, Brian. Yeah. 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 And a lot of times, you know, some of them don't hit it. As uh, you know, in some of the other paintings, I just poured varnish on it and threw cedar chips and base coated it and started again you know yeah the, the, the underpainting all that energy is still there from the previous you know and uh and you get you know thicker paint and texture and uh yeah it just all adds to the piece and it's not so precious i mean for me the scariest thing is a white canvas brand right. new yeah i mean I, I, I always have to put a tone ground and just mess it up you know yeah. I, I think we talked about that during the studio visit like i think i talked about it both both with both of you separately like the idea of a perfect white oh. canvas or a sheet of paper something that you almost don't want to make a mistake right i think that's exactly. when probably if you're if you're starting out as an artist or even even if you're in the trade for so long like you i don't know you, do you feel the pressure of like 
a white canvas and you do you feel that pressure if you don't want to make a mistake so you do need to lay like that ground layer on it or uh just to get something onto the canvas or metaphorically most, canvas could be like panel or paper yeah most definitely just to uh you know a lot of times i'll do a tone ground and then i'll look at the piece and you know squint and just see the big shapes Okay. And it's like, okay, let me just put in a blue or green and, you know, leave the tone ground if there's, uh, you know, reeds or something in the foreground mm -hmm. and just get those large shapes and then start, you know, maybe then project uh, an image, the drawing on top of that, and then, you know, start chiseling away. Or, or sometimes, Jay, what I'll do is like, especially like when I have a brand new sketchbook, that's like the hardest, yeah. right? Yeah. So. You know, it's like, oh my God, all these beautiful pages. It feels like this book, everything has to be an A plus piece. Well, yeah. that's not true. And the way to break that, you know, way of thinking is sometimes I'll just open it up, start in the middle or, you know, the last third, I'll just open it up and I'll start there. Or um, sometimes I'll take charcoal or I'll put some paint on my fingers and just sort of mess up a couple pages, you know, through, I'll, kind of pan through it and just sort of dirty a few pages up um, so it doesn't feel so precious so they're always they're almost kind of started already yeah um, uh, another way another way I'll work is um, I'll take bits of paper and lay it down like a collage like a beginning surface so that's started already um, so I can go and maybe one day I'll be inspired oh yeah I'll, I'll start a sketch on that collage and then and then I build from that. So, so there are ways to get around that intimidation of a clean, perfect piece of paper or canvas, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you have to get, you have to find your own way, you know, to get over that, that block because, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's just paper, you know, yeah. it's just paper. Just paint on canvas. And you can always cover it if you don't like it. You That's know, you right. Can, if yeah. it's a really bad drawing or unsuccessful, you can just always cover it with something else, with collage or paint, you know, keep working on it. Maybe so. we can talk about the collages a little bit. So let me just pull it up. So, so you know, I think one, one of the more, I have, uh, just so everybody watching this knows, we have, I've known both of you for a little while now. Brian, mm -hmm. we've worked together for a few years I think we've done about three shows together yeah. actually just something in my timeline on Facebook came up we uh one of our first shows at gallery 40 south during Pac Mac I think 2014 I did a two yes, person show but in you. the tattoo parlor yeah the tattoo place right. with uh, Brian Hogan and you that came up and I'm like oh I remember that show I can't believe it was like seven years ago already yeah. but wow uh, that yeah. was uh, one of our first times working together. And then we did, uh, you were part of an exhibition I did at the, I guess it's now the Museum of Contemporary Art, the Patrick Arts Council space, um, modern iconography. And then we have um, that was great. Yeah. some of those composite images. And then we did a, a solo show at Roast, the coffee shop. But Tina, yeah. we've never worked together. Not and, really, uh, no. And I, I think what's interesting, because I, again, I think we talked about during the studio visit, when we met, you were exclusively a sculptor. And yes, correct me I if was. I'm wrong, but that was pretty much your career up until the last five years or so. You right. based primarily in sculpture and clay and ceramics, right? And Yes, yes, it was. <laughs> yes, it was. And then, of course, our business also. But um, yeah. yes, it was. It had been for 28 years. And um, so, maybe we can pull up your website. Yeah, if you want me, I can talk yeah. about the transition a little bit. Yeah, um, let me pull up your past. Yes. Website. If there's anything in particular you want me to highlight, just uh, let me know. I can open it so, up. Uh, yeah. So, so these totems, uh, those are really that was really a, a very interesting time. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I had really been doing functional work and tile and um, really mosaic work uh, up until for quite a number of years. Yeah. And the figure was always something I was very intimidated about. Uh, I wasn't interested in the, in the figure. I didn't really particularly have uh, an interest in figurative work by mm -hmm. other people. Um, and, you know, Brian and I were exploring shamanism and uh, some other spiritual realms at the time. And during a class, we, we were 
doing a meditation and um, something happened. Uh, my chi was released, so I was kind of told later. But anyway, I felt a sense of freedom uh, through doing this meditation and um, following that experience. Uh, I went back to my studio a few days later and I, I had this urge to start making these crude figures yeah. in my red clay, uh, female figures particularly, and, and covering them in like a white slip, which is a clay-based glaze basically, on these figures and giving them a very worn look. Are these them? Uh, no, those are later. Uh, actually, I don't know if I... There's some white figures. That was my production work. Uh, let's see. There's some white pieces. Is there, is there a, uh, like a white... Uh, this, this one here. This one right here. Totem. The totem. That was one of the early pieces that I had done. Um, I've saved that one because that was like probably the strongest one out of that little beginning series. Yeah. And... Um, so I thought, where are these coming from? Because I, it was, I just, I had no idea. So, they, but I just didn't question it. I kept working. And then I started to research. Uh, I, I'd spent some time in Africa, uh, West Africa. I took a trip there. I studied there. So I, I started to kind of reference some of those images. Uh, and so I was informed about the meanings of bull and antelope and these were medicine, power of medicine animals, and mm. they had different meanings. And so I said, okay, so that informed the work I kept continuing to do. And so it was this sort of back and forth of referencing other cultures and where these animals may have been coming from. And then it just kind of inspired me to continue. And I, so I, so, so the, so the figures became more uh, ornate. They had um, kind of a ritualistic quality. I wanted them to appear to be sort of handled and worn, okay. that they were uh, used in rituals. And it was a very powerful time. I, I uh, became a, uh, um, a Reiki II um, practitioner during that time. Um, I, was, I explored other modalities of healing and you know, it was just a very interesting time. Anyway, that was for about five or six years I was making these and they, they, they kind of had their purpose and they had their time. Yeah. And um, I, uh, I just, they, they became contrived feeling after a while making them. So I stopped making them and I made some tile for, for a while after that. I did a community project with Gallery North is, is this a, no, some, do you have that on the uh not uh, that project but these okay. were some tile this was a custom tile project i did for a client okay she wanted some a mexican inspired tile um backsplash and she wanted all different patterns so i came up with 12 patterns and uh arranged them there is a pattern to those mm -hmm. um a repeat pattern um, but anyway, so <clears throat> that was really fun to do. Yeah. But, you know, after all of that, I just started to question um, working in clay and uh, it's sort of, uh, you know, it, I just didn't feel like I had the time and the energy and the same joy level that I had had in the past. Uh, so I started, I, I had the urge to start drawing again. So I listened to that and I started to sketch. A little bit and in, in 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 a few months i made the decision to sell my equipment i was ready to let clay go <laughs> so i sold my kiln and my other equipment and uh and i i dedicated myself to sketching from then on that's and do you do you miss sculpting at all or working with the uh, ceramics i, I still really can't don't you told, you're i still can't believe you sold it i i really don't really <laughs> <laughs> i don't i don't i feel like um with with sketching it's, it's like the other it's the, it's kind of like uh, complete opposite it's it's portable number mm -hmm. one you know so i can travel light i can do it anywhere yeah i can sketch with using minimal materials a, a fine liner uh, a small travel set of watercolors if i want i can bring a little bag of collage materials and a glue stick yeah you know i can travel that way i can do it anywhere in the house you know where ceramics was the total opposite of that. You know, I needed a dedicated space. Uh, I had expensive equipment. 
I needed a lot of materials always on hand to make anything, you know, and time and energy, which I had less of, <laughs> you know, at this stage of my life, you know, my mid fifties, it's, uh, it's, I, I feel it's very freeing, you know, yeah. it's very freeing. Sketch. And, um, now, I always thought it was interesting because when I first saw these works on uh, at their Facebook, on your website, I was like, oh, wow, Tina's doing something like totally Totally different, different from what I from what I was used to seeing from you and uh I think these works even though they're like I don't know if you want to talk about anyone in particular right now but maybe we'll do the the chair um the chair piece but um sure. the work is so textural like there's so much depth and space in it like there's multiple layers like you said and I think this is um I think it's illuminating for if someone's thinking about sketches, they probably think like a, a sketchbook and pen and ink on paper, and that might be it. But you add so much additional uh, content and material to the works that they, they almost feel like a collage, but they're, they're mixed media pieces too. Like they kind of go beyond like that traditional sketching. It, well, thank you, Jay. Yes, they do. Yeah. Well, so when I was sketching for a while, just using a fine liner and even like a gray marker and watercolors, you know, for a while it was great because I was really learning and getting, feeling confident again about my line sense. And, and then um, like, I found like I needed to, to, to do more. I wanted to, do, you know, explore more and like kind of get back into the materials, you know, that tactile mm -hmm. sensibility that I was used to with clay. So uh, I, I took a class in mixed media online and that okay. really opened up a lot, you know, of, of how to approach it, um, how to set up your page or your board that you're working on and how you can combine um, sketching with writing and collage and paint and all these other materials. So that was a, a great window for me. So, so what, uh, so with this chair, for example, um, it, it's kind of a little bit of a story um you want me to go to is this the first one or yes yes that yes, was so, okay. so that really that started as basically a uh, a drawing in my book my little um i have a little travel book yeah and um it was a chair we were renting a house with some friends and there was this big white lazy boy in the middle of the room and it was this huge colossal chair like it was just you know iconic lazy boy white leather chair and everybody took their turn sitting in it, it was really funny so, but but it was so, there's something about it that I kept thinking about. So I had to sketch it, and when I brought it home, I researched Lazy Boy a little bit and you know how it came to be. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, were visiting my sister soon after that, and um, she just moved into a new house and she had a new job, and all that was in her house was this white chair. Also, that she was waiting for this furniture delivery, and she had just taken on a new job, uh, a leadership position in, in the community. So I thought about this chair and the word chair and how it's used, you know, chairperson, you know, you're the head, it's a throne, you know, it kind of had this, this, um, this formal feel to it. So I kind of expanded on it. So I had a page in my, in my book in my little sketchbook where I had laid down newsprint. This and so you can easy. see that, yeah, you can see that here. So while I was visiting her, I just sketched her white chair and the blanket on there and a little pillow and she had some artwork behind it. Yeah. And, uh, and I started writing about it and writing about my sister and how she's becoming this leader in the community and she's independent and she's got her own place and all these things kind of fed the image. And um, so I added all that in there. I wrote about it on the sketch itself and I added paint to it. I, you know, I um, kind of painted around the sketch itself. And this was just done in like a ballpoint pen. Oh yeah. And, and I used markers and, um, you know, and so that's kind of how that came to be. So yes, it was layered. I thought about it. It had layers of meaning. And um, so it's, she actually has a print of that in her house. Yeah. Yeah, so. And that's what we're gonna be displaying too, is a, a print of the original. Yes, drawing. yes. Like, so most of the things that are gonna be hanging on the walls 
our prints, which is also yeah. I think interesting because when I when I saw the prints at the studio, I'm like, oh wow, these are they almost looked like the the real sketches, like they were just blown up, but the the photographs or the prints were were pretty interesting. But that also makes sketching like more replicable. Like you can you could make these works reproduced and you can make them and hang them almost as if they're you know, it, it goes beyond the sketchbook. It goes into that yes. realm of like class, you know, like that traditional fine art where it's hanging in a gallery and it's framed and it's it's kind of removed from the environment that it was created in. Uh, right, right. Know, I mean, it was in I my think sketch interesting. Yeah, well, also, I think, you know, Jay, you bring up a, an interesting point about the prints because to me, it makes it more accessible for people. Like, you know, it's, yeah, they're yeah. affordable. Anyone can yeah. own these, you yeah. know, and, and um, and that's what's great, you know. It, it was actually this. The original is three by five in size. Yeah. Yeah, it's in my little sketchbook so here. It's got the yeah. post-it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but so by enlarging it, you know, it just makes it a more powerful piece. But also it that does, other people yeah. enjoy it. You know, that chair takes on a wholly different different presence when it's enlarged, and of course, yes. it dominates the visual plane too. What I think is interesting too is how you started the initial sketch on two sheets of paper. Like, was that, um, is that just how you intended to do it? Like right from the get-go, like I'm gonna work on this one work of art across two different sheets. Cause I, it seems like after you did uh, the work on two sheets, you then condensed it to the one side of an open book. Like this is on one sheet, right? Yes, well, I guess Jake, I guess um, I, I did want to do a two page spread that was intentional yeah, okay. when I started doing the lazy boy because it plus it was just so big yeah it needed two pages <laughs> this thing it was inflated I mean it was just so so funny um and when Kim's was a little more tailored um you know it didn't have the same scale but it had a more like it was it's a slip cover on there it had like just the piping and stuff it just had a more formal presence and so um and it, it i i felt it just would size well on one page so okay. that's really why yeah. yeah and there's just so much um detail in here too and uh i know we, i actually during the studio visit too but the text the the newspaper print that you have here it's you just it's a found newspaper print like you didn't pick it up because it had some sort of meaning to you or to the piece right or not necessarily yeah i mean again i i was laying it down for the texture the initial texture hmm. and i didn't think at all about what i was putting down because that's kind of the point of it you know you don't want to overthink yeah you know when you're working in mixed media because then it just you just wreck the flow so so i you know like that's what i'll do sometimes i'll prepare like two or three pages ahead of time in my sketchbook just laying down scraps of paper so that it's a yeah. basis for texture that's really why i do it and then so where the yellow area is say that's probably some newsprint and other like pieces of envelopes and you know things that you normally would throw away i just saved and uh, so th that's there really yeah. to build up the texture uh, to give it a tactile feel yeah, i really i really I do like because there's so much going on too like of course you can see the overall image of just, just the chair and then you can make out like the the other drawings that you've done like the the pillow and the yeah <laughs> uh the the blanket but then of course there's a lot to um not distract you but a lot to like kind of observe and take a look at like then you have your handwritten text i assume that's your your writing yes it is yes left hand side and then of course if you want you can still read like the actual article or parts of the article so there's a there's this i i think it's very textural and and filled with so much depth that i think people would people i don't i don't think i i think you might not associate that it was just traditional sketching and again this is i think these are great examples of uh, just another way or a different approach to sketching that one might necessarily not think of like if mm -hmm. if you're thinking about sketching you might you do probably think like oh i gotta draw this perfectly but sketches aren't meant to be perfect they're not meant to be like oh, no. you know like they're they're meant to really get your ideas out there and you do even i don't know if you sketch too brian but if you do like i'm brian I'm does like, this like if you're working on a composition like that process probably changes and progresses as you, you probably have multiple sketches all relating to, to one work, right? Or Very much so, yes. Yeah. And uh, 
it's nice with sketching as you said earlier it doesn't have to be a finished product yeah. it's it's quick and immediate and mm. you want to get the ideas down quick and um yeah maybe you know we've discussed that artists have sketch certain sketchbooks they did don't show to the public yeah yeah we it's, did yeah, yeah. it's yeah. you know i mean you want to be free to you know try a crazy idea or something and uh not have to show it, you know? Yeah. Or, or you have personal writings in there that right. are just really for you to get yeah. out, not for anybody yeah. else to read. And I guess one more thing, because I almost forgot about it. We are exhibiting a, a bunch of different sketches too. They almost feel like series too. So we have the chairperson, yes. but we also have some of these, uh, I want to call vegetable studies. Yes. We have yeah. carrots, we have uh -huh. beets, but we also have like uh, the dinner for one and a few other. Uh, I love these, these kind of like assemblage pieces there. Uh, well, how would you describe uh, like the sewing lesson and uh, get your, how would you describe these works? Do you see these, them as theories uh, or? Well, I would say, well, um, well, I, I am a contributor to a blog, uh, right. uh, my friend's blog for about five years now, which kind of came to me early on. And so these are really for the blog. They're kind of editorial pieces, I guess mm -hmm. you would say. You know, she gave me my own column. Um, and so, um, so I, I kind of come up with my own themes and most often they're seasonal. Um, and then I'll do a piece of writing about it. Uh, so, so this was their narratives. Uh, this was a piece for Memorial Day. Uh, so obviously it's grill season and um, I got really thrilled about that. It's, it's funny because our, our business really, that's like <laughs> this deadline everybody fears is Memorial Day. You know, it's like yeah. that's the deadline to get everybody's homes ready. Yeah, so right. everybody, we all cringe, you know, because that's when the season technically begins out east. Yeah. You know. Memorial Day to Labor Day. So anyway, so um, it's kind of ingrained in me. So anyway, so get your grill on with something. It was a little catchphrase I came up with and I wanted to just create all this floating food, you know, around the barbecue. Like it's fun, it's whimsical, it's time to party and let loose. Summer's here, you know, that kind of capturing yeah. that, that spirit. So, so, but I do like the narrative approach to illustration. I really do. Um, so that's, I, I do kind of work in that mode sometimes. Um, as same with the sewing lesson. Yeah. Um, that piece, I just loved how so many sewing terms had these metaphors to them. So I decided to play on that a little bit. You know, old patterns don't fit. There's a common thread, okay. be safe. Yeah. Um, and it was kind of like was this was a reflection uh, on the meet of uh, the uh, Me Too movement that was really kind of coming to a head, like really kind of coming into the light mm -hmm. about women in the workplace and phrases we were using and things like that. So, um, and I just, I love old sewing notions. You know, I, when I was a kid, it brings me back to learning how to sew. My grandmother to taught me. And so I have all these a box of old notions. So I'd like to kind of bring them out and draw from them a lot of times. Yeah. Now, how would you start a work like this? Do you start with like freehand sketching or is this more, cause this one seems to be a little more carefully um, composed cop, like planned out, like you plan to put, I mean. Yeah, so so I basically, I kind of, um, yeah, so I start, I start with kind of uh, brainstorming with all my sewing phrases you know, kind of writing them all down and then kind of kind of coming, pairing them with images. And then a lot of times, so this, I had a lot of the images. So I'll bring those all in front of me on the table. Okay. And then with a light pencil, I'll just start to kind of play around on a scrap piece of paper, like the placement of things. And um, when I have it finalized, then I'll go on to my watercolor piece. This is the, an original mm -hmm. and I'll just kind of, duplicate my my thumbnail laying things out when I have it placed I'll go in then with a fine line or an outline okay all my images and then finally I'll go in with watercolor and and finish things or sometimes a marker if it's real fine work but that's kind of yeah so so there is some planning and and, and it's um there is sort of a, a thread if you will through it all like a process <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah of how I do it but uh, but I just love to play with sewing notions it's something I've kind of returned to 
from time to time because I just think it's so rich. It's just got a lot of great nostalgia for people. It's relatable. Yeah. It's manual labor, sort of a recall to that and how that's kind of lost in this generation. And yeah. so, um, so it has a lot of fond memories for me. And then you also have uh, these kind of vegetable scenes to these drawing or Yeah, so drawing. that was when, right, I was getting more expressive with my line work and my watercolor. I, I just was really dialing into um, gaining more confidence and control over watercolor and just exploring to, to you know, into what it, what it could really do. And I love the expressive quality of these vegetables and the immediacy and working quickly mm -hmm. while things were damp, while things were wet, what, you know, the ink running and bleeding and then it yeah. sort of feel like soil. And, but just, um, I love, I respond to the seasons that we're in a lot of times with my subject matter. And to me, the fall, I just love the light and the colors. Yeah. It's really my color palette is the fall. And so it gets me excited. So, you know, vegetables and things that are rich in those colors, those root colors just excite me. And so I wanted to really express that and, and um, capture that in, in, in these watercolor vegetables. So um, yeah, it really does show because there is like this earthy quality too, but I love that you bring up color because I think it also is a nice segue into Brian's work too, because yes. Brian also seems to be an artist that responds to color and nature. So mm -hmm. it's, it's so interesting that you have to work, you work outside a lot of the times, you said. Yes. How, why, um, just thinking of the best way to phrase the question, but what drives you to need to work outside? What do you get outside that you can't really get in a studio? I just, ever since I was little, always loved to be outside, you know, whether it was playing ball with my friends, uh, but any excuse to get outside. It's true. And, you yeah, still do. I still do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when we have lunch, you know, at work, I say, okay, I always know a spot where we can go sit and have lunch. You know, there's a, a, a marina basin in West Hampton Beach, and all right, we're going there today, or yeah. in um, Sag Harbor, there's a, a little memorial park, you know, you can sit by the water and, and water is, is always in my images. Yes. It's, it's very powerful, whether it's a river or a stream or yeah. ocean, you know, you can uh, attach a, a million metaphors and meaning to mm, water, yes. you know, it's healing, you know, it's yeah. cleansing. And, timeless. Uh, it's timeless, yeah. It's always just, moving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's something, something just really, uh, mm special about being in nature and, and yes. that really does shine through in your painting too especially if we if we talk about the sky in this one mm. um it's so expressive too i love these actually i really love the, the i guess i want to say purple that it she is has yeah too. purple like and is that something that you seek i mean i know you you let the painting eventually dictate how did right. you how did you get to this point of the sky because it's it really is like captivating to see like the the transitions of color, but overall just the, this patchwork of different colors kind of. Uh, yeah, and with color, Jay, I mean, I just love it to scream. I mean, if I can use it straight out of the tube, I do. Yeah. And uh, as I said earlier, if you're out there and you're observing nature, maybe you see there's a hint of purple in the clouds. And so I'll build up to that. You can see some of those warm grays, and then I'll yeah. add a little purple. Then, you know, you can't, it's like, putting too much salt on your ear of corn you know you just want a little hit of that bright purple and a couple of dots and leave it alone get off you know yeah and uh, <laughs> the same you know with the greens it's you know how far can I push them and you know when I go to Dick Blick I have to go to each different um, manufacturer because oh I like this green you know and uh, this one doesn't have it and so you know, yeah. you'll, you'll build up really? your uh, palette that way and uh yeah, it's, it's a trick just to build it up in layers. Sometimes with oils, you have to let it dry and come back to it uh, to build that up. I mean, certainly when I studied Monet, I said, you know, he didn't do this all in one shot. You know, he yeah. built this up, scraped it, got that incredible texture. And then uh, just the markings. Again, here's your drawing, you know, the those greens and the reeds. You know, it, with oil, you got to hit it and leave it. You know, I mean, you can manipulate it if, oh, a little too bright so you, you know, brush it a few times it'll soften mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of the trick is just hitting it and leaving it and say you know if I don't like it I'll let it dry come back and 
you know, work over it, work with it, uh, whatever. And I just love the, I think it, these works really remind us to study nature so closely too, because one mm -hmm. of the things like you get all these different colors in clouds. Of course, when we think about clouds, our first conception is like these puffy white clouds, right. pure white and against a blue sky. But when you really start to study them, especially at different times of the day, like you can get these different colors, like you get these yes. violets or you can get these pinks and yellows. And yes. I, I think that's something that's uh, uh, really inspiring in your work is that you almost encourage people to take a moment uh, to not only study the paintings, but also look at after when they're done, or maybe if you're doing it in plein air, just you're, you're really studying uh, the environment that you're in and you're paying careful attention to the colors and colors, uh, you know, the light changes over the course yes. of the day. We always have like this golden hour where everything has like this uh, yellow hue, but uh, I think it's something that's maybe it's common. It happens every day, especially when the weather's nice. So maybe we take it for granted, but mm, when you do right. stop and actually uh, reconnect with nature, it's just something like it takes you out of the moment. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it, does. it does. It, it does. really does. And uh, to get back to the color, you know, the yeah. sky can become a little sacred, like the white canvas and uh, I'll find I'm just using blues and variants mm -hmm. of blues. Mm -hmm. And I, I had one professor when I was younger, he always said, you know, Brian, just remember the sky ain't blue. And uh, <laughs> in other words, you know, take chances and yeah. I'll see other artists that will, you know, pull the green, put some green in the sky, you know? Yeah. And, you yeah. know, on a clear blue day, it's kind of hard to give yourself license to do that. but. You know, I'll tell myself, look, that section, that sky is not sacred, you know, just you know, put something up there, muddy it up, you know, put a blue, yeah. blue put a brown, put a pink, orange, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, another piece that I want to bring up is uh, the pine trees that we have here, because I think we can all make out what we're looking at here is kind of the base of a tree, but uh, obviously the colors that we see here aren't really found in, in a tree. So how did, how did this work come to be? Well, this is very interesting. Uh, I mean, ever since I was young, I always admire, uh, admired Vincent van Gogh's work. And, you know, I have books and books on him. And uh, again, it's as I was talking earlier, uh, getting colors that are not local, they're not out there and pushing them beyond that. And so uh, as inspiration as a teacher, I'd always go to him and say, let me see how he painted a tree trunk. Yeah. And uh, this particular piece, uh, he did in Arles and it was, uh, you know, the trees with dandelions, it was a spring piece. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, so uh, he himself studied uh, Millet's work and, you know, the sower and, you know, pieces like that. and. And he's, I'm going to use the term copies, but he worked from it and, you know, eventually it became his own, but he studied that. And I said, well, yeah. let me carry on the tradition. Let me do this here. And uh, I love the square format. Mm -hmm. So I cut the rectangle down to a square and I love the pop artist as well. And so I said, let me incorporate that. So I applied house paint enamels and greens or whatnot to get the, the basic shapes I discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. And then um, I had a drawing I did and I put it on my old fashioned projector and projected mm -hmm. it up. And I used, you know, Rust-Oleum shiny black house paint to <laughs> lay it out. And then I worked back into it with oil and build the oil up. And, uh, and then at the end, maybe I covered up too much of the black and I'll go back and, uh, and bring that mm -hmm. forward. But yeah, I just love, you know, the blues and the purples and yeah. the reds. And, you know, if you look at a tree, you can see hints of that. But it's like, all right, let's amplify that. Let's perch it further. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, again, use some ultramarine blue right out of the tube in your darks. Yeah. And uh, that's a big thing. I want my darks to resonate and not turn to mud. Yeah. And this is a very exciting piece. And it is very, like, of course, you could, as when, when Tina sent it over, I'm like, oh, this reminds me of a Vincent Van Gogh painting. But <laughs> I, I do lectures on him and I, I've studied him a little bit. And it does yes. have like that, that post impressionist feeling to not only the, the expression of color, but how they use these unique uh, croppings of the composition. They're also right. focused, like, it's, it's a very formal piece too. Like you have all these lines and shapes and very expressive, vibrant colors. And right. it does have like that decorative technique, that kind of flatness, but there's also a lot of depth in it too. And 
Yeah. Um, like there's there's a lot to unpack and uh, to, to see because you can kind of follow the ebbs and flows of the blue and just even the blues are so different colors. Now, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that you're using multiple materials yes. in your work too. So I was wondering if you could expand upon that. And what are the, some of the differences between like house paint and oil and enamel? And uh, how do you decide when to use a particular material in, in the painting? Well, the, the, um, the house paints are nice because uh, they'll dry overnight. And if I want to block in the big shape, you know, I can do that quickly and, uh, you know, start maybe some blue for the sky and blue for water and a green. I'll let that dry and then you can further chop into that and uh, you get there quicker. I mean, you know, to do it with, uh, you know, oil paint, I'd have to use the whole tube and, you know, use Liquitex or something to, uh, you know, get it to flow and dry quickly. But I just, you know, want to do it, you know, a day and then a day later, be able to work back into it mm. and immediately start working. And then, you know, as it goes towards the finish, obviously the oil is a little slower drying. So I'll set it aside and come back, you know, a day, a week later and then build up some more. And, uh, you know, it keeps the, the clarity between the color, the color yeah. separation. Mm. That's it's just it's so I, I'm really excited to uh, I know I saw it in person, but I'm more excited to see it when we uh, install the exhibit too. like it's, oh, it's really <laughs> colorful. I think people are really going to be drawn to it. And um, I know you you also incorporate like found objects too. I know when we were, when we met, we were talking about the clog pines and maybe it's a little hard to see, but you have like this texture uh, yes. um, in this work too. Now, can you um, explain how you created this piece? Sure. Um, there was probably another painting underneath this that, uh, <laughs> you know, was headed for the reject pile. And uh, we, uh, the house we were living in at the time had cedar trees. And, you know, I would sweep the driveway and I had these five gallon buckets full of these beautiful little, you know, twigs from the cedar trees. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I laid down the base coat in enamel and then I took uh, varnish you know, acrylic varnish and just really poured it all over the whole piece so i would have some time workability time and then you know i just scattered all these cedar chips into it and uh i wanted to do that also so i wouldn't get too detailed too mm -hmm. fine uh, just because of the material it wouldn't allow me to paint a, you know a clear crisp line you know it kind of kept me true to my mission you know yeah. and uh yeah, this was wonderful. Yeah, this is in the Quad Wildlife. And it was actually, you know, I just walked it recently a couple of days ago. But there's one area on the west side where there's trees and brambles and it looks down onto the water and the water was reflecting the sky that day. And that's how it was painted. But when I looked at it as I'm done, I said, well, you know, it could also be you're coming up a hill and looking at the sky. Mm. Yeah, the water. yeah. So I can see it. Either. I can see it like yeah, that. It definitely yeah. feels yeah. like an incline, like you're, oh, yeah. Yeah, what's, yeah, over, like you're what's over that exactly. hill? Exactly, what's over the hill. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, this is actually the blue that we see up here is is the water reflecting the sky above, how you yes. originally saw it. Yeah, you do get a different feel when you're I yes. have known that I, I do get that feeling that you're walking upwards into yeah the yeah it could go all over you know you're either yeah. up high looking down mm -hmm. to the water or you're down below looking yeah. to the yeah. sky yeah that's yeah and then you have, now you have two different ways of looking at it which is yeah yeah, yeah. Interesting. yeah it's fun it is very interesting uh -huh. <laughs> now yeah. one more thing I wanted to talk about the the earliest painting that we have here roughly these paintings span roughly uh 25 30 years right yes uh, this is is this the newest one am i correct the pine trees is that the most recent one or that is most recent jay yes um so this is probably from what 2000 do you, do you remember like last year okay like maybe, this you know, maybe last two year, or three year. years ago okay and i keep this painting because i'm still trying to make the next one as good as this one Okay, it, and it's a struggle because you know I nailed it on this one, and then the follow-ups are not coming up. You know, so <laughs> all right, you know, I'll get there eventually. Yeah, yeah it takes yeah. a lot of strikeouts. And, and two, yeah, it does. I've, uh, I'm working in acrylic, um, so it's a whole different media. I worked with it in my uh, commercial work, 
Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, now it's just, you know, you can't fight it. You're not going to have, I mean, there are extenders and whatnot, but, you know, I, I just try and use it out of the tube and I've been able to, you know, get some nice blends with mm. it. Uh, but again, it's still building up texture. So I've gotten some tubes of their, you know, texture that you add the color to, and I'm going to try that to recreate the oil because the oil yeah. is like, you know, really gooey and sticky and I'll just mix up a pile of it. Like with the whites, I'm looking at that in this painting and, mm -hmm. you know, you practically could just trowel them on, you know, to get that uh, texture. So, uh, yeah, and that's where I'm at now, mm -hmm. wow. trying to create that texture. But yeah. the earlier ones uh, uh, would tend to be, uh, you know, less so. I guess this one, like, I mean, uh, I think that's behind you now, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, before <laughs> Cynthia, everyone loves that one. And I, I gave it to Tina, so it's I can't sell it. <laughs> but, but, but there are prints available. Yes, we can make prints. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm happy nice. that we can at least exhibit it for a few yes. months. But um, again, and, this was one yeah. where uh, I was working in a house over a period of time. And uh, next door, this forsythia was blooming. So I took several photos of it. And again, it was pretty traditional. If you look close, there's like a red oxide toned ground on the canvas. Get rid of that white. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I, I didn't, I don't think, I didn't project this one. I just sketched it up and uh, built out the background. And, you know, Fairfield Porter is also one of my favorites. And I love how he branched abstraction and realism. So in the trees, I kind of gave myself a little liberty to have those beautiful almost like camouflage patterns that he'd come up with. And, uh, you know, same with the, uh, the rust reds uh, of the dirt underneath mm -hmm. the, uh, the forsythia. And so it was a pretty fairly fluid and quick painting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, with the yellow, again, I wanted it as strong as possible. So I, I did a, a cadmium yellow medium or deep uh, underneath it, let that dry. Mm -hmm. And then came in, you know, with cad yell light, you know, maybe yeah. a little bit of white mixed in, but just, you know, I wanted it to scream. Yeah, and it yeah does. I love that. Very yellow. Yellow. Yeah. yeah, it does have that illuminating quality, like it's filled with so much light. And yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things that I was always drawn to when we first met, like when I first saw your works on the display, it was just like all these, um, this this intense color of this vibrancy of the color but the formal yeah. elements too and uh, of course I wasn't introduced to your landscape works initially when I oh. when we first when I first met you we had I saw like these composite uh almost like yes. silhouette figurative works which um yes. which I think I can maybe just pull up just to kind of show the oil. yes you can kind of see like this was one of the earlier works that i saw like these kind of which is I, I i don't think i've seen something like this before of course um yeah i was an undergrad i studied a lot of italian i mean i studied uh some modern art too but i just haven't seen like something this like formal but like this this composite image which is very uh -huh. interesting and and these ones are are very interesting and they remind me of the one that was sitting behind you when I came to the studio visit of the I think it was a boat scene like that you had that nice transition of colors yes uh, in it's the background it might be right over there yeah yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah but I I work on both works uh you know as I'm drawn to them and uh I consider them all landscapes you know I mean okay. one can be a uh, you know an actual landscape and these are, you know, landscapes of the dream world, of the mind. I mean, this particular piece, I remember it was interesting. Uh, one day, you know, we're having lunch and I said, I need to come up with an idea for another painting. And uh, we were um, uh, reading the New York Times and it was like, you know, the international section. It wasn't long. And I said, I'm going to go through just this section and pull out uh, several images and I'm going to make a painting out of that. Yeah. And um, there, there was this one scene where, you know, Russians were going into Chechnya or something like that. And there were all these tanks moving in. And so, you know, I, I sketched that. And then uh, in another page, there was an outline of something. I'm going to use that. And the blue shape was actually a story about elephants. It's actually a, oh, an yeah, elephant. You can kind of see the trunk. silhouette of an elephant. The silhouette face. of an yeah. elephant, yes. Yeah. The trunk, yeah. Yes, uh -huh. and then, uh, you know, the woman was definitely out of, you know, the pop art theme, you know, I, you know, or 
whatever, you know, with that bright pink and, you know, the uh, artificial environment. And uh, so I just worked that all together and kind of the dots are kind of my signature yeah. uh, thing. And that's, you know, all with oil paint. And uh, I just uh, wanted to do that. And uh, the background, you know, it transitions from a, a green yeah. to yellow into orange. You know, I love those rainbow rolls. And so, yeah, it was just a, mm. a painting from that section of the paper that day, you know. <laughs> well, but not, I mean, it was composites that you yeah, put, yeah. Yeah. made your own. Yeah, these composite images are so interesting. And then I know when we um, we did Modern Iconography, that show in 2015, you also composited. Oh. So this was based more on a, yes. like uh, art history, had the the Manet, Olympia yes. in the center, the silhouette of a Vincent van Gogh self-portrait, and then you have, um, I forget, the De Buffet, Buffet. I think. Yeah, De Buffet yeah. in the background. Just, yeah, yeah. Again, it's a collage like what Tina is doing, and uh -huh. uh, yeah, but just yeah. let's pull all those different aspects of art history together and yeah. uh, see what happens. Yeah, and and you said just uh, you you consider these kinds of paintings landscape paintings too, just but they're they're so different. That so that was one of my questions was, do you see these as different series of works, or for you are they much more interconnected? Well, it's a bit of both, Jay. Um, yeah, you know they are connected, not their landscapes. I mean the images out of the paper. I'm always drawn to, you know, international photos of places, and so they all play a lot in the work. But, uh, you know, at times I'll need to break away, like uh, the ones that are kind of industrial pop art, you know, using the, uh, the you know, uh, industrial materials and whatever. And sometimes, you know, I just want to be a little more freer and, you know, squirt the paint out of the tube and get it up on the, uh, on the canvas and move it around. Yeah. So I'll go back and forth and uh, more so in the, the warm weather, I'll do the landscapes because I can get outside. And, uh, you know, when it's crummy in the winter, you know, I don't mind being in the studio and, you know, working on the other pieces. But, you know, the, the ideas are always flowing and, mm -hmm. you know, going down in the sketchbooks for both. Yeah. And it seems like I just one more older example to you're also not afraid to incorporate like objects into your works, too. So I think this was on view a few years ago at. Uh, yes. You know, like a member show at the Patrick Arts so. Council. And then you kind of framed the work with bottle caps too. Did you yeah. have an, like, is that an experimental technique that you wanted to do or uh, what, what was, what was the reason behind framing well, this? Always, it kind of looks like a conch shell, but yeah. Uh, yeah I'll tell you a story on that painting. It's it. interesting. We, uh, we had wallpaper in our bathroom and it was all, you know, these kind of aquatic forms and it was a conch shell. And I'd sit there and look at it and I'd say, I see a face in there. Yeah. You know, that's something, you know? And so uh, I did the drawing of it and, and projected it up there. And I think I called it water spirit or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, again, this was uh, again, an old painting and I wanted to nuke it. So I took uh, plaster and then I ran pieces of auto body tape between the colors okay. and built up a surface like that. And it was super smooth and uh, built up paint colors and the enamels and then, uh, you know, projected the image of the, uh, the water spirit on there. And then I just love all these lyrical, you know, kind of shapes around it. And yeah. again, that will come from a drawing I do. And then I'll just magnify the drawing and then lines just, become this they become big shapes yeah, yeah, yeah. and so again it's the pop art thing i projected yeah. it up there and did that and the bottle caps i've always loved folk art you know mm -hmm. and it's just like they'll incorporate anything that's available and i said you know what it almost uh, makes it less serious a little humor to it yeah I said, i'm just gonna put bottle caps around this <laughs> yeah. painting and it also protects it when i bring it to a gallery that they don't scratch it on the that's floor. true it does have that protective uh quality yeah. to it too yeah, these are yeah and again this was just so much because this is how i was introduced to your work so then when i saw right. the landscapes uh, it, it almost felt different, but now that you're, the more you talk about it, you can kind of see that they are interconnected and it's, right. the colors seem to be interconnected too. And then this was the earliest one. Yes. Uh, is going to be on display from the, well, you dated it 1998, but I think when we talked about it at the it studio, was it, it was earlier, earlier, right? 91 or 92. And uh, 
this piece was uh, accepted into the Hector Museum show of either 92 or 93. And it was an interesting piece because again, initially it started as a different painting. If you look at the mountains in the background, I had been to New Mexico years earlier and I took a workshop in Santa Fe and painted for three weeks up there. And you know, they were small paintings, you know, uh, nine by 12. And I brought one back and I did a large piece and, you know, it was on the wall. And again, it's like, you know, I'm not crazy about it. And so uh, <laughs> I went out uh, on location, actually, you know, with a big three by four canvas in Quag. They have a wildlife preserve there and, uh, you know, a lot of areas that are around it that are undeveloped. Mm -hmm. And so it was a pretty much straightforward depiction of the trees that were there. And... Uh, I did that on location and while you're working, you know, you hear a squirrel or something and one day a deer came by and, you know, we didn't have cell phone cameras in those days. Yeah. So I said, oh man, I got to put that in. So, you know, I went to a reference photo and added the deer. And so it's, it's from three different sources, you know, from a, a New Mexico mountain landscape painting on location and a photo reference and yeah, uh, it all works yeah, and it's so it, yeah, it does it all works together and i think that's the story is so illuminating too because when you if you were to see this work with no like artistic explanation you would see okay it's a it's a wooded uh landscape right. paintings, but now with the story you could make out like the the new yes, mexico that. mountains in the background and then right. The, the Long Island, Quagga. Yeah. Trees. The, trees the, woodsy. Like this, the very specific yeah. pine trees. Yeah. 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 So it's a totally inventive painting. Again, like the uh, the modern pieces, you know, it's totally invented. Yeah. 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 Which is, it's so, it's so cool. Yeah. cool. Yeah, this, this composite. But it's also like illuminating, illuminating how, just how artists are. And if you're not satisfied with the work, like it's, it's just revealing that you could repurpose it or yes. invent it and um yeah it, it shows a flu fluidity of art too that you know it's not yes. always set like because one of the one of the things is how do you how do you know when it's done as an right. artist when do you decide the work is all right i'm not putting a single more uh one more brush stroke or one more uh, line on this it's done how do you get to that process do you ever feel like your work is done or do you always not have a really back mind yeah like the yeah no, it's, you know, um, to edit it i i had one professor at brooklyn college he said you know it's almost better to stop a piece before you think it's done because you can overwork it and yeah. even after i've sold a piece and if i'm fortunate enough to be in that person's house i'm like can I have it back for a week? Yeah. It's not done. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, it's it's it, it's hard to say, you know. And Tina, do you ever feel like the similar question? How do you know when one of your mixed media works is necessarily like when you when how do you decide? All right, this is a printable work. Like I'm going to get this blown up. I'm going to frame it. How do you? get to that point where you're essentially moving on from that piece well i think it's 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 become an intuitive thing and um you know like say for my mixed media pieces or something you know there's there's as we talked about when you visited jay there's like nine layers to a lot of these things and there's steps and mm -hmm. uh specific things that i do to each layer and by the time i get to the ninth layer um you know, if if it's muddy or if I feel like it doesn't work, it's like, okay, well then start another piece. You know, the next one might feel better. So like, I just, I accept the fact that I'm finished with something, especially with a mixed media piece that I have nine steps to. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. move on if it's not ready because you, you can make another piece. Um, and, and, um, and as far as my sketches go, uh, you know, I look at some of the things I've done and go, you know what? Oh, yeah. Like Brian says, you know, if I could just maybe I'll add some more color here or add a little shading there or add a little texture behind these groups of, of objects that they can sit on something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's um, I think you're always kind of feeling like you want to tweak mm -hmm. yeah. something um, like this piece. This I OK, getting back to your other we were discussing you know how many pieces you have to do to get to feel like you've got an a plus yeah well 
I started a sketchbook just where I was doing these mixed media pieces and, and they're, they're like seven inches square, eight inch square pages. Yeah. And at night I would do like two pieces together. And so I was doing them night after night. And finally, I just, I was tired one night and I just did this. This was the second one of the two page spread. And I was, it didn't take me that long, um, but it felt, it felt like it was done. Like it felt like a strong piece and wow, like all of those previous ones that I had done felt like they were worth it because I came up with <laughs> right, and, so you just um, kind of inherently know because this work does feel like it's done to me like thank you like it has the text I see you have uh, a stamp for a bird is that a stamp or because I know you yeah well it, it is a postage too. stamp and then there's a piece of collage that's over yeah. top and then it's actually two this is part of a stamp this bird it's sort okay. of I think it's uh, Middle Eastern Arabic or something, and yeah, then this yeah, is like an yeah, this is like a what's a U.S. stamp, but they're old anyway. Uh, yeah. yeah, they they um, that was part of the collage step, the dry collage step that I do. Okay. Um, but yeah, this one does feel done, and um, I've sold actually several prints of this. Yeah. This is yeah, oh, a lot great. of people own this. Yeah. It's a, it's, I like this piece a lot. Mm. This is a great one. Yeah. So I don't want to take up too much of your time, but maybe we can do some concluding questions. So you, sure. you've both been together for 30 plus years. I know you have a business together mm -hmm. too. Have you ever uh, uh, collaborated on like a work of art and shown it together as a joint piece? Have you ever done that? Or do you keep your art practices somewhat separate. <laughs> no, no, we've very much influenced uh, each other throughout the years. Yes. I mean, yeah. way back uh, to 91, to that deer painting, Yeah. Uh, Tina would come over and visit my studio and she was doing, uh, you know, production work, ceramics. And she'd go, wow, you know, look at all the Southwestern color influences. I'm going to go use that on my bowls. Yeah, know? And I did. I mean, Brian's yeah. color, like this color palette really influenced my early ceramics. I mean, the purples and the cranberries and the golds and greens. Mm -hmm. And because and I was working on a terracotta colored clay and I wanted to leave the background. So we, through the years, we've cross pollinated yeah. naturally. Yeah. But as far as an actual collaborative piece, we've talked about we've it. We've talked about doing it, yeah. yeah. Uh, not too but long we've... ago, we were in um, a house where they had some you know, really beautiful artwork mm. and there was a large piece, probably eight foot tall painting. And in the center was uh, you know, 18 by 24 a piece, like something Tina would do, you know, applied to the canvas. And to me, it looked like a green marbly faux finish and then some red lines. And I said, you know, we should do yeah. something like that. Let's yeah, just collaborate, yeah. You know? So I think we will yeah, it's eventually. Like very soon. Well, that'll yeah. be exciting to see. I'd want to see that. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. <laughs> we'll yeah. show you as soon as Yeah, we know. for sure. Yeah, we'll have you over again. That'd be nice. Yeah. That'd be good. So... So you both, uh, I mean, of course, you've, you've been working for a long period of time. Do you have, or what are some challenges you might have faced as an artist and how did you overcome them? Like, I'm, maybe we've already kind of discussed this uh, inadvertently through the process or, but mm -hmm. has there any been a particular challenge that stands out that? Well, like an author or anything, you're going to get blocked from time yeah. to time. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is to not freak out or worry about it that's what we feel is just you know relax be in the moment you know I've you know put stuff aside and maybe not painted for months you know and I'll go concentrate on music instead yeah. or uh, do a different medium you mm -hmm. know go to uh, uh, sketching or uh, years ago I took a workshop at Kripalu up in Massachusetts and he was a poet a writer an artist and it was all about being out in nature and that's a very beautiful setting mm -hmm. yeah. and so we did a lot of uh, experiential pieces there uh, and he said you know if you're a ceramic artist he goes don't touch ceramics you know go over and paint and the reverse you know mm -hmm. do something you're not comfortable with and and you know that thought helps from time to time yeah i, I yeah. think brian i think that's a very good point because um that's what i find definitely helps is um 
first of all, you know, you have to accept that you're going to get dry periods and you're going to get blocks and you just yeah. have to like, Brian says, like, just relax and accept it. Don't fight it. Just right. do something different, whether it be, um, you know, trying a different medium or reading about a new subject you don't know much about or, you know, trying a new activity or just do something completely different because you maybe you just need to refill the artistic well yeah <laughs> maybe, maybe of, you just need to refill and get re re-excited yeah. reignited about something different you know yeah. and, and and it does come back but you can't i think there's a myth when people say well i've got you know inspiration waiting for inspiration to happen well it doesn't work that way you have to cultivate it mm -hmm. and when you get blocked one way to cultivate is just what we're talking right. about is to do something different or do something mechanical go go reorganize your studio that's a huge thing yeah. i find that when i'm my ceramic studio you know there'd be periods of time where i just didn't clean up and it would become a you know it, it, it becomes a hindrance so the time yeah. that i would spend like a half a day reorganizing clearing the space ideas would begin to flush in so that's a huge tip for people just start organizing then mm -hmm. reorganizing and then you're making space for new things to come in you yeah, know i definitely agree with that like the space you're in kind of informs like your own energies too so yeah. if you're in like a, a disheveled you're letting it in then you yeah. might yeah you, you might not feel like comfortable enough to make something or Right, because you have all this stuff around you. Yeah, yeah. and you're blo you're really creating blockages. Yeah, the clutter of the space leads to the clutter yeah. of the mind, and right. right up, yeah, so it's I think that's that's totally accurate in that. Regard. Yeah, and um, so on the opposite side of things, what are some accomplishments in your career that you're uh, most proud of as as a visual artist or as a as an artist in general? Oh, I would just say never giving up. Yeah, that's huge. <laughs> that's my greatest accomplishment. Yeah, just that's huge. Stay in the course, you know, stay in your lane, as they say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, staying, staying committed, I think, yeah. is what I'm most proud of, too. Like, you know, come hill or high water, good times and bad times. You know, art has always been part of our lives, has always been an outlet, has always been um, necessary, you know, and uh, gotten us through some difficult times yeah. and supported us through great times. Um, I think, so I think, yeah, for me, it's, it's, in general, it's, it's staying committed for as long as we have, making the time for it, always like allocating space for it. Um, and, and yeah, making the time for it, that's huge. And it's not always simultaneous, you know, one of us will be going through a dip, but then the other one's, you know, on prolific. Yeah. Yeah. And I just say, well, you know, you're great, you know, just run with it. I'm just not there. So I'm going to play music. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. So that, that's your thing to be yeah. able to go and strum or work yeah, out music for right. projects you're doing. And that, that's just as important yeah, of an yeah, outlet. It yeah. Probably helpful to have that support system of each other too to kind yes. of uh, get you through these blocks or those down periods too to yeah that's something you can kind of that's very key you know, Jay like, the fact that you know there's so much already understood mm. you know between us because we're both creative and we were so compatible that you know we don't it's just it just we really do support each other. We understand. Yeah. You understand. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You understand. You support. get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's huge. Yeah. yeah. It goes now, through life like that. Yeah. If there's anybody watching this that might be like an emerging artist, do you have any like tips on tricks? How do you find like opportunities for your, uh, for yourself, like either exhibition opportunities or funded projects? Do you have any like recommendations for like how, if, if you haven't exhibited for a while, how do you get yourself into a show? Do you send out application for open calls or? Well, I think the greatest thing is, you know, being belonging to one or two art organizations. Yes. Because yeah. then you're with a group and, um, you know, with the world where it is today, so much information is coming in, you know, there's going to be too much. You can't do it all. So that's good. Yeah. You're going to find opportunities there. That's and, I think that's huge. Yeah, you know, like like Jay, of course, you know the library. Mm -hmm. Um, and just but just um, yeah, I think being a member of a local art organization is a great place to start mm -hmm. because there's always a member show. Yeah, 
every year. And sometimes they're not juried, sometimes they are, but that's a great way to begin uh, or work towards, mm -hmm. you know, and um, also online, you know, also, um, well, sure, there are groups, Facebook groups you can join and maybe through that mm -hmm. uh, there, are, there are showing opportunities. Uh, Instagram, of course, uh, you can follow certain things there. You know, there's online opportunities. That's um, probably leads into the next question too, is like, how do you promote your art to like, how do you set yourself away from a pack to like, I, I feel like artists these days, they almost need like an online presence too, or, or do you agree? You do. Or, like how else would you how how else do you promote your your art and your uh, career? I think we're still trying to figure Instagram yeah, out how yeah, to do it. I mean, yeah, I mean Instagram, you know, it's difficult. Yeah, we I, follow people and watch what they do uh, to get educated. You know, watching yeah. that, you know, and see how they do it. How do they get it out? You know, I follow one woman um, from Massachusetts and. She kind of does the old fashioned way. She has like eight galleries, but she's still online and someone wants to work. Okay, go to Portsmouth, this gallery over here. And, uh, but you know, others do it differently. You know, uh, again, it, we're still figuring it out. Yeah, well, in February, I plan to launch a store. Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna have a lot of my prints and some of my images on, on nice products and things like that. I'll have some yeah. collections and stuff. So. So, um, I'm going to be figuring out the promotion for that. Um, yeah. Uh, but also, um, the fact that I'm a blog contributor, you know, my work gets at least once a month. Yeah. It's it kind of put out there, and we have a 6,000, you know, readership following the blog. So, it, and that's globally, you know. Yeah, that's um, awesome. so, so, yeah, so a lot of people have contacted me through that i've had some sales through that and and i have you know a nice following there so that's been huge for me um so but yeah it's difficult to figure out yeah, it's almost like this them. other side to the art business not only are you uh, creating content you're creating work but you also have to do that whole business side yeah of the, like marketing yourself uh, writing up a statement and a bio it's a lot and, of work you it's know? a lot i always say look we have a business this is supposed to be fun time. <laughs> <laughs> you know? it is yeah. but i'll still do it the old-fashioned way jay i'll have photos of my work and we're working in somebody's house i see they have some cool artwork Mm -hmm. I say, you know, we're both artists, you know, you want to uh, take a look. Here's a piece okay. that's finished. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do that. And, sometime. I, I sometimes okay. like the human contact, you know? Yeah. Yeah, which is missing a lot with the internet. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, you do lose that. I think that also touches back on the idea of being part of a local arts organization too. Yes. So you can also meet other members and attend like community events or uh, gallery events and just kind of even attend like receptions and openings because then you could also meet like other artists or uh, collectors or sure. curators and uh, definitely Jay. The contacts you made yeah. in these uh, personal environments are very uh, I assume they would be influential and important too mm, definitely um, yeah. thanks for mentioning all that yes yeah. and one last question before we go is um what is uh the one thing if someone took something away from the exhibition and seeing this work what is uh, what's your hope that people would take away from this exhibition? What's something that you strive to get across to the viewer in your work? I just love it when people experience the work and come up and tell me what they see in it. You know, even, you know, certainly the modern piece is very much so. I mean, I don't, I mean, there's layers to it as we've discussed how yeah. to arrive there. Mm. And I just love people coming up and telling me what they've seen. They saw something else and I'm going, wow, that's interesting. You know, mm. I can use that further down the road. And, but with this current show, I would just love them to experience the landscapes and, and tell me their feelings about it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah in, in a way, I, I, I agree with Brian, you know, it's, it's the relatability. I, um, I'd love people to, for it to strike a chord um, in a nostalgic way, or you know, some of the mundane things that I've sketched, people look at that and go, "Gosh, yeah, I have." My, I saw your whole like I have, in the sketchbook page. I'm going to put in the case, 
you know, like personal items, you know, toothbrush and razor. It's like, these are things we all have, you know, like yeah. it's just kind of strikes a funny chord with people. I, I would just love for people to relate to it and look at it and notice it in their own lives and think about it, you know. And just people coming into a situation and looking at art, um, you know, a gallery could be somewhat intimidating for lay people, you know, you know, I met a woman once at a workshop and I said, yeah. well, I'm in a show, come down. She goes, oh, how should I dress? What should I do? This, that. Like, yeah. you know? And to talk about the work, they're intimidated, but I think the library is, you know, a little more relaxed. Yeah, uh, it's a public yeah. place. Yeah. yeah. I think it is like a much more accessible environment too, because it's not, it, it's not the main focus when you go to a space. Right. You know, it, it adds a different component to the library. You don't feel the pressure of needing to like bone up on your your discourse right. in art. You can just go right. you can also check out a book or a right. movie or attend a program. And then of course, uh, one of the aims that I try to uh, um, achieve with this with this uh, space is to make the the gallery seem like a professional space, but also making art accessible to the general right. public. And of course, yes. through exhibition opportunities, but just maybe introducing people to art that they might not have seen in their everyday life oh, to exactly. kind of give the gallery to to or to give the artwork to the people which yes. oh exactly yeah, and yeah. just getting just getting them in there you know getting yeah. over the fear and as you say maybe some works they don't understand well you don't have to just come in and experience yeah, it, yeah just you know? look at it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? i mean that's a big thing to realize yeah it's for everybody yeah you say, arts for the people yeah yeah well thank you guys so much well, for thank the you conversation. Jay. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation. I hope everyone I that too. watches this uh, uh, enjoys it. Um, again, places we've been will be on view at the Claire Davidson Siegel Gallery, uh, located on the lower level of the Patrick Medford Library. Um, now, November 1st through the end of the year, December 30th. So thank you all for tuning in and um, enjoy the show. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Jay.